Hi, uh, my name is Terry Koopman, and hello. Um, thank you so much for your class. I've enjoyed your class, and I've enjoyed learning about revolutions, and it was actually very informative. Um, our history says a lot about what's going on today. Uh, anyway, so I wanted to uh, talk about the um, Russian Revolution as my main revolution. Uh, the Romanov dynasty, it lasted uh, for three centuries, from 1613 to 1917. But by 1900, uh, people began to become disenfranchised with uh, the Tsar Nicholas II. So, um, you know, they were tired of his corrupt government. Uh, he was seen as a weak leader. Um, and we can also compare this to uh, King Louis the 16th, uh, right before the French Revolution, he was also seen as a weak leader. So, you know, people that are disenfranchised, you know, they need to have some strength with some backbone, someone with some backbone, you know, showing that, you know, they actually will do something uh, for them. So, uh, Nicholas tried to uh, make concessions, so he established his October Manifesto, uh, wherein he established his uh, constitutional, uh, constitutional regime. Uh, however, it actually worked against him because it gave unexpected uh, power uh, to the people, uh, to the nobles, and to the elites. Um, it also gave more rights to the population, and it also created uh, more of an appetite for reform for the intelligentsia. Um, also, additionally, there was a, a new enlightened middle class, and you know they were also being awakened, and they were also you know raising awareness, and they also saw that the Tsar wasn't really going to be helping them much out as well. So um, people began to question his authority, and they began to uh, dis disobey his autocracy, autocracy. Um, so uh, Russia entered World War I uh, in, uh, on August 1st, 1914, and by uh, January of 1917, uh, Lenin gave his uh, revolutionary speech wherein he declared that Europe was ready for revolution. And, you know, the, the Russian people, they listened. Um, you know, they were tired of World War I. You know, everyone was being killed. I mean, it was just, it was completely devastating. They were tired of being hungry. And yes, they were ready for revolution. So by uh, March 8th of 1917, uh, or February 23rd on the uh, Russian, Russian Julian cal calendar, the uh, February Revolution uh, began, and uh, where thousands of angry workers, they marched through the streets of Petrograd, um, factory workers joined them, they closed their factories, you know, hundreds of women joined, and they were marching, and, you know, they were, they were just ready, ready for this, for this revolution. Um, they, uh, they were irate, you know, these mobs, they destroyed police stations, and the Petrograd army garrison, they actually killed, uh, they killed a lot of people. Um, and uh, Sheila Pet Fitzpatrick, she describes uh, this uh, in detail in her book, The Russian Revolution on page 44, in quote, in the last week of February, bread shortages, strikes, lockouts, and finally a demonstration in honor of International Women's Day by female workers of the Vyborg district brought a crowd onto the streets of Petrograd that the authorities could not disperse, unquote. And she goes on to say that, quote, the police was disintegrating and troops from the Petrograd garrison brought into the city to control the crowd had begun to fraternize with it, unquote. And quote, by the evening of 28th February, Petrograd's military commander had to report that the revolutionary crowd had taken over all railway stations, all artillery supplies, and as far as he knew, the whole city. Very few reliable troops remained at his disposal, and even his telephones were no longer working, unquote. So as regiments from the Petrograd garrison, they also, they began to defect to the other side, to the side of the people. And even the Cossacks, they just, you know, after time, they just stood back, and they weren't even defending uh, the monarchy. And uh, the soldiers, they began to form committees uh, for the Petrograd Soviet on March 11th. And actually, uh, Tsar Nicholas, he dissolved the Duma and uh, Russia's legislative body, and on March 15th, Nicholas abdicated his throne, and there wasn't even a shot fired. So when Nicholas abdicated his throne, it was just, it was just, he just kind of just went with the flow, and he just, he just left. Uh, there was not a shot fired. Um, and so the Duma, he, they formed a provisional government, uh, while the Petrograd Soviet issued orders to obey only them. 
And on April 1917, Lenin, he issued his April thesis, uh, wherein uh, upon his return from exile in Switzerland via Germany, he issued the 10 directives uh, to his fellow Bolsheviks calling for the Soviets to take power, and where he issued his famous call for peace, land, and bread, which became a big influence for the future October Revolution. However, uh, in the forest of Ekaterinburg, uh, Nicholas and his wife and their five children and their four servants, they were being held hostage uh, by the Bolsheviks. And on the night of July 16th, 1917, they were all herded downstairs into this really small basement and they were shot to death. And the ones that were still semi-alive were actually hacked to death. So, you know, the Bolsheviks, they completely eliminated the monarchy and therefore their competition was gone. Um, and so on October 24th and 25th of the Julian calendar and November 6th and 7th, 1917, the October Revolution occurred where the Bolshevik party, which was led by uh, uh, Vladimir Lenin, he launched a, a bloodless coup wherein uh, it was against the provisional government and, you know, he took over government buildings and they basically took over um, the city of Petrograd. And after a week of street fighting, they formed a new government with uh, Lenin as its leader. Um, so however, a few months later, in the beginning of 1918, the uh, Russian, the Civil War began, and uh, it lasted for three years. It was fought on many fronts, and uh, both the Red Army and the White Army, they both engaged in extreme terror, you know, as they went through their towns People were terrorized, and you know they were both both guilty of this. Uh, the Reds, uh, they were made up, of course, of the Bolsheviks, and the Whites were made up of uh, monarchists and uh, anti uh, anti Bolshevik armies. Also, uh, Western powers were on the side of the Whites. They helped the Whites out because they wanted to uh, reestablish an Eastern Front. While the Civil War devastated the economy and economic and political collapse helped the Bolsheviks rise to power. The Civil War also helped the party to make quick, clear, and effective decisions, which also helped the Bolsheviks uh, gain their influence. So, you know, the Bolsheviks were, because of the Civil War, they were just, all of a sudden, you know, they were the leaders, and, you know, they were the ones that people looked to, and, you know, it enabled them to show that, you know, they were quick, and, you know, their decisions were just, you know, they were very firm. And so they really, really gained power and influence over the people, um, but they also became more centralized. And any opposition to them all of a sudden became their enemies, uh, which prompted Lenin to make his famous statement, whoever, quote, whoever is not for us is against us, unquote. And we all know who said that as well, um, you know, our famous President Bush. Um, soon Lenin's ideology of a highly efficient and productive economy achieved through discipline, regulation, and militarization revealed that there was no concern for the welfare of the workers. Military jargon also entered party politics, and uh, we can see in, you know, the uniforms of the Soviets. They have this sort of military-style uniform, and that was, you know, brought out from this, this time period um, during the Civil War. You know, their army tunic boots, uh, you know, that became their standard uniform for, for party members. And they, you know, the Bolsheviks, they maintained that military uh, culture. The Bolsheviks took over a war economy, and they set up war communism and they abolished uh, private property and free market. They nationalized banking and credit and large-scale industry, and later on it went to small-scale industry. They prohibited free trade, and they basically left the economy virtually moneyless. So people, they needed to start bartering to make deals, and because basically money had little or no value. An already terrible food crisis continued to get worse. And so the Bolsheviks began to requisition the grain from the peasants to feed the towns and their Red Army. They sent soldier brigades to, the, to go get the grain in the countryside, which obviously created a very strained relationship between the peasants and the Soviets. So um, this was a terrible time for the peasants. You know, they were starving, but, you know, their grain was being requisitioned to feed the army and the towns. So, you know, people were just, the army was just marching in and they were taking it from them. Um, also, the Polizzi Borough was also created at this time, and it became the most powerful institution in Russia by 1921. By the end of the war, the Soviet state was more centralized, and uh, the party had primacy over the state, and important decisions were made only at higher levels, 
without consulting the population below. So, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it, you know, the important decisions were at the top. They were made at the top. And again, you know, the, the lower classes, they were not consulted at all. You know, say the bottom 99%, you know, they weren't a part of it anymore. So, you know, slowly, you, can, you know, we're starting to see that, you know, this revolution was really not going to be for the benefit of uh, the workers. Um, so the Bolsheviks, they started to look at large scale agriculture and they began to establish state farms and collective farms and which again made the peasants very resentful. And by 1922, uh, it's important to note that approximately 10 million people lived on the verge of starvation. And so the new economic policy, the NEP, was established to, uh, for concession uh, for the peasantry and it gave them incentives to plant, uh, to expand production, and to market their grain. As Lenin knew that the starving peasants needed help or else they would turn on him, he decided to no longer uh, forcibly requisition the grain. You know, he was trying to make concessions to the peasantry. Um, and so uh, they, were, they were allowed to sell their grain freely after they paid their taxes. And the NEP was really seen as a really, as a, it was a, as a light in uh, the Soviet period. It was very positive. It became a model for state capitalism. Um, it generated economic growth. It brought a market economy and it really improved the standards of living. Um, the peasants, you know, they were finally living semi-decently and um, they were content and the harvest was good until 1927 when they had a really bad harvest and grain prices dropped. Uh, so what happened was the peasants, they started to withhold, withhold their grain uh, from the market. And Stalin, of course, did not like that. So he eliminated private land ownership and he began to collectivize agriculture and he put it under state control. And there went the nap, it came to an end and there went the, the end to, you know, that, that semi-free market that the farmers experienced um, during most of the 1920s. Um, in the early 1930s, the Great Retreat began. As Stalin wanted to blend the Soviet system with the original Russian traditions, and he wanted to bring the people closer with the state. Um, it also, this Great Retreat, it, it made concessions with his people. He wanted to make concessions to the collective farmers and peasants, and it also tried to make a more soft approach toward the intelligentsia. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they were allowed a little bit more to, you know, write their poetry, create their art, you know, a little bit more freedom, even though, of course, most of it had to benefit the Soviet system um, and to promote it, of course. Uh, those that worked hard, they would be rewarded for their productivity. Uh, people uh, were given more skills. Uh, they were, they, they had little competitions in their factories where, you know, winners would be rewarded. You know, people were given more incentives, a little bit more, give them a little bit more of a will to, should you say, live to, you know, actually do better. Um, uh, the old intelligentsia, the communist officials and the professionals, they uh, also became the new elite. And also this new middle class, they enjoyed these cultural pursuits. They enjoyed ballet, they enjoyed art, they enjoyed poetry. And, you know, a little bit of the old Russian culture tradition was, was in society. And, um, and that was, that was uh, very, very, uh, it was just, it was good for, for Soviet morale. Um, and, you know, the Soviet art, it was, it was, um, it, it needed to have socialist values because, you know, the masses, the vast majority of the people were literate. So, you know, symbolism was extremely important uh, in, in the arts. As agriculture was now collectivized and the peasants were now working on state farms, the revolution from above began and it saw Soviet control over the countryside. It saw extreme Soviet control over the countryside. Um, the war on the peasants saw terrible brutalities from the state, uh, including forced entry and uh, confiscation of the little grain and livestock that they had. Um, you know, uh, family members, like, you know, their kids were starving. They were starving. You know, here's these farmers are growing grain. They're raising livestock. And here come these Soviets in, you know, they, they march in their kitchens and they literally, like, like ransack their, their cabinets for grain while their kids and their family are just left to watch. You know, they're growing this grain and they can't even feed it to their families. They have to give it to the state. So, 
it was a horrific time uh, for the peasantry. Uh, the peasantry were also seen as criminals. And also, this was also a time of dekulakization, where the richer peasants um, were deported. They were sent to the de gulags. Um, and, uh, you know, never to be seen again, most of them. Uh, the gulags, they were, you know, they were work camps, but they weren't like the Nazi uh, concentration camps where, you know, those were death camps. This was more so-called work camps, even though many, 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 many died because, of course, you know, lack of food, overwork, you know, horrific conditions. So, you know, most of these people, they were just sent away, never to be seen again. Uh, families were split up. Kids were left orphaned, you know, roaming the countryside. It was, it was really a, a horrific time, um, especially for the peasants. Um, and so on December 1st, 1934, a high-ranking uh, member of the Polizia Borough and the political elite was shot. And uh, Stalin, he became paranoid that this would happen to him as well. So he uh, established his, his uh, reign of terror, and he was so afraid he'd be the next victim and, uh, you know, he didn't want to, obviously, be executed, and uh, he, he was just, he became paranoid, and he thought everyone was an enemy from within, everyone was his enemy, and uh, arrests began, and uh, the reign of terror, it was terrible because, you know, everyone was a suspect. Um, the great purges, uh, they literally removed anyone who was a threat to the regime, of course, most people were innocent when they were arrested, and you know he he instigated brutal interrogations, and people were innocent people were interrogated, and if they found nothing to make them guilty, well, they would find something to make them guilty. So then they would torture them more until they brought out something that would make them guilty, even though they really weren't. Of course, um, it was just it was it was a horrific time. People were arrested, they were deported to the gulags, um, and you know if you if if you were a family member of someone who was arrested, you became a potential enemy as well, so you would become arrested too. I mean, if you had any acquaintance with them, a family member, you were also a suspect. Uh, so the people lived in fear daily of a knock on their door in the middle of the night. Um, they, you know, I once read an autobiography, it was of this young girl, and her, her, um, her father always had by the front door this little, like, like kind of overnight bag with like little like emergency supplies in case he would be arrested in the night. Uh, he would grab that bag and he'd have these like these little precious supplies with him while he was having his experience in the gulag. Um, so, you know, they were constantly on edge, these people. And, you know, neighbor could uh, denounce neighbor. And uh, the great purges, you know, they also arrested the intelligentsia uh, and also anyone who had relatives um, that had a foreign connection. If you had any kind of foreign connection outside of the country or a relative, you were a suspect. So then you would also be arrested. And, um, you know, everyone, so many people went on the blacklist. It was just, it was terrible. And so, you know, because a neighbor was denouncing neighbor, people, you know, they were just, they had to become so guarded. So they began speaking Bolshevik and they basically lived dual lives. You know, inside their house, they could be themselves, but as soon as they left, the outside, they had to speak Bolshevik, which means that they would need to uh, represent Soviet culture perfectly as, you know, put a mask on their face and just be the perfect Soviet communist so that they would not be under suspect of, you know, a friend who could turn them in or anyone they needed to speak Bolshevik. And so, you know, it was a guarded lifestyle. It was an extremely guarded, guarded um, lifestyle. The Great Purges, they reached their peak from 1937 to 1938. And it left millions of ordinary citizens arrested, exiled, and executed. Stalin's reign of terror was also very similar to that of the Jacobin terror in the French Revolution, where dissenters and anyone who opposed the Jacobins were under suspect, which were usually the innocent, just like the Soviet terror, where, as described in Censor and Hunt's Liberty, Equality, Fraternity on page 89, quote, the Committee of Public Safety set the machinery of the terror in motion, unquote, and while, quote, Robespierre loudly defended the people's right to democratic government, while in practice he supported many emergency measures that restricted their liberties, unquote. As stated by Censor and Hunt on page 88, we can also see this in Lenin's original help for a socialist democracy became a failure as his government merged into a communist Soviet state. And, uh, you know, there we see that, you know, hope for democracy, you know, it seems like there's a hope for democracy, 
and then it fails. Um, additionally, both revolutions, the Russian and the French revolutions, they saw women marching for bread, one through the center of Paris, and you know, some women marched in the center of Paris towards Versailles in the French Revolution, and the other women, they were marching through the streets of Petrograd. Also, equality for women also emerged due to both revolutions as marriage became a civil contract, as uh, the churches were abolished, and also in both revolutions, uh, you know, women became more equal, they just became more free, uh, they were allowed to divorce, and so they were no longer held you know, prisoners in these horrible marriages. So, you know, both revolutions saw, they really saw equality, more equality for women. Uh, another similarity with both revolutions is that both experienced dechristianization policies where anti-clericalism led to the expropriation of religious property, religious institutional power was opposed, and some bishops and priests were killed. In Confiscating Church Gold by James von Helden, it states that Lenin initiated a three-part plan to undermine church authority including, quote, attempts to split the church from within, unquote, quote, assaults on the religion of national minorities, unquote, and, quote, a scheme to confiscate the vast wealth of the Orthodox Church, unquote. According to Sensor and Hunt on page 92, in the French Revolution, churches closed and were sold to the highest bidder, and the clergy were forced to, quote, who had taken the oath of loyalty <clears throat> to abandon their clerical vocations and marry, unquote. And like I said before, you know, art, in both cases, art, you know, you, on one side you had the French Republican art and the other revolution, you had the Soviet art, you know, they were both used as symbols, you know, to promote uh, their causes, uh, their revolutionary causes and their, uh, their new regimes. Um, <clears throat> however, though, with all of these issues, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, nostalgia for the things of the past turned the Soviet legacy into something seen as more sentimental longing for the past instead of its darkest days. And just as the deaths of Nicholas II and his family had uh, become both nostalgic and mysterious, so also were the deaths of, you know, the arrest and the death of Louis XVI and, you know, the beheading of himself and his wife, Marie Antoinette, you know, they're all, you know, they're so nostalgic. I mean, how many paintings do we have of all the stuff? And, you know, in a way it's like all the stuff is praised and, you know, somehow it becomes mysterious and nostalgic. And, so, you know, the darkness of the past, it kind of doesn't seem as dark anymore as it used to be. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there is also, we can see some affection for the past as uh, we read in m the Memoirs of Barrer by Bertrand Barrer recalls in his recent past that, quote, my soul puts forth regrets for the loss of Louis XVI. In the sweetness of his disposition and his natural goodness, he was preferable to any other and was worth more than all his race without any exception." Unquote. It most certainly seems that as we look back to our past, a sentimental longing for the past deletes the negatives. But unfortunately, it makes one wonder how we can learn the lessons of history if the darkness has been diluted. Um, and, you know, Sheila Fitzpatrick, she says this well, uh, quote, "...the pledge of liberty, egality, fraternity is a part of almost all revolutions, but it is a pledge that the victorious revolutionaries almost inevitably dishonor, unquote. Um, she's saying right here, which is what, to me, which is really what spoke a lot to me about this class, what I really learned about the revolutions is that, you know, you have these revolutions, you have these revolutionaries who are, you know, they're so for the people, you know, they want to establish this coup, they're so for the people, and, you know, when they take over, all of a sudden, everyone's going to be equal and we're not going to have these, you know, oppressive governments and, you know, the rich are not going to reign. But what's happened in the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution uh, is that, you know, they take over and instead of being for the people, all of a sudden their own greed takes over and then, you know, again, the bottom 99% are left out again and then they have to just deal with another uh, greedy government. Um, you know, it just seems like in human nature, it seems like greed just really overrides um, really what the human heart really wants to have, but greed just completely takes over and and somehow there's something there's a there's a there's some kind of a quirk in human nature where most people cannot handle being rich. And so that's why it seems like these revolutions fail, just like uh, Sheila Fitzpatrick said, again, you know, the the pledge of the victorious revolutionaries almost inevitably dishonor. And, um, you know, I can look at the, our political revolution of today. I've talked about it in, you know, most of our Blackboard assignments, but it's just, you know, I can't, how can you not talk about it? I mean, this is going on right now 
in you know our 21st century. We have uh, Bernie Sanders leading our political uh, revolution, and not to be you know promote him or anything, but you know he's a leader of this 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 current revolution, and it's nothing to be downplayed. You know, it's the same thing. You know, the people, the bottom 99%, they want a future to believe in. You know, the bottom 99% in 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 uh, pre-revolutionary France, they wanted a future to believe in. And the bottom 99% in Russia, pre-revolutionary Russia, they wanted a future to believe in. And so, you know, it's always the same thing. You have the 99% that are oppressed, and you've got the temp one, top 1% leading extremely selfish lives, you know, and their greed has like literally taken over everything. And um, however, the the difference I think with Bernie Sanders, again, not to be promotional, but we're talking about revolutions right now, um, is that, uh, you know, I his greed, he does not have greed. You know, he spent his whole life, you know, fighting for the ultra, ultra down and trodden oppressed, oppressed people. And, you know, I've seen pictures going around with him wearing old shoes as, you know, he's standing giving his speeches in front of, you know, 10,000 people, you know, thousands of people. You know, he goes to this, this White House dinner the other night and they're all wearing tuxes and he's wearing his old simple suit. So, you know, maybe he is one of the very, very, very few who would not let greed take over if he were to win. And therefore, you know, what Sheila Fitzpatrick just talked about that perhaps he would not inevitably dishonor uh, what the uh, revolution, revolutionary message originally was. So, uh, you know, um, this is a very interesting class and I learned a lot about revolutions. Um, I, it's, it's quite a thing and it's going on today and hopefully that maybe the revolution that is happening today could actually finally lift up the bottom 99% so they can actually have a future to believe in. and. Uh, thank you for your class. I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the subject. I am actually uh, signed up for uh, my final thesis class this fall. It's also regarding, um, I forgot the name of the class, but Russian, I think it's i think it's Russian revolutions too, or it's something like that, or it could be just the Russian history. But um, So this class will be very helpful for that. Uh, thank you very much, and have a nice summer. Uh, thank you again.